Welcome to this evening's Mansfield College Friday um, conversation. My name is Helen Mountfield. I'm the principal at Mansfield, um, for those of you who don't know me. And um, speaking with me this evening, um, I hope in a minute when they have their cameras and mics on. Um, yeah, there's Serena and there's Miranda. Hello. Um, <laughs> speaking with me this evening, now they're here, um, are um, Miranda Wayland. Um, who is the Head of Creative Diversity at the BBC. And we're very pleased to have you here, Miranda. Thank you for speaking to us. And um, Serena Arthur, who is um, a Hi. publisher and uh, graduated from Mansfield College in uh, 2019. And so I thought it'd be interesting to have her um, voice and perspective here too. And we're going to um, have a conversation about how, how to um, promote inclusion and diversity in our creative industries um, in general. So um, welcome, Miranda and Serena. Welcome back, Serena, sort of. Um, <laughs> I wish you were here in real life, but never mind. we'll do that one day. Um, but I just wanted to start off uh, maybe just by hearing a little bit about your career path and your journey. So Miranda, do you want to start off telling us how you got to be the woman you are today? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Helen. It's so great to be here um, and have this opportunity to talk. Um, my career has been quite a checkered, zigzagged career. Um, I was very fortunate to grow up in an environment where actually there were multiple job opportunities. So um, knowing who I was and, and establishing myself probably at the same age that your students are doing now. I think one of the things that I was very conscious about in terms of my background was that I always wanted to be the best at whatever I put my mind to. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that, you know, Actually, I knew I needed to work in large teams. I just don't do very well. So don't stick me in an edit suite in a dark room for 12 hours at a time. That would just freak me out. But I think I'm starting to learn about more about myself, which then kind of led itself to multiple jobs. And so the way that I, I came into the creative industry, media industry in particular, was that I ended up working for a charitable organization called Youth Culture Television. Um, and they were really teaching young people um, who had a dis disadvantage or had a disability about film. And I had no experience in that, having come from the retail sector, finance, I'd kind of had a checkered career in that respect. And I came into this environment and this world where actually the whole of creativity was allowed to run free. And I was like, I was overwhelmed by it. So the closest I got to television was kind of just using my remote control. And then I'm open to this amazing world of opportunity. And I fell in love with it. And in the five and a half years that I worked there, I was fortunate in enough to be able to produce my own content, work with some of the major broadcasters, develop talent, identify talent, and then got a real sense of some of the barriers that were surrounded. So it wasn't about the creativity anymore. It was about the difference that these people were bringing, which wasn't often as appreciated as the content that we're making. And I couldn't quite understand the disconnect because the organization I was working for at the time was predominantly black. And so I never really felt out of sync. I didn't have to hide my identity. I didn't have to suppress who I was. I was very free to be myself. And then I was fortunate enough to be headhunted by ITV where I spent nine years with them but my entry into their into that world was to develop a training program in Manchester that could be rolled out around the uh, the organization and during that time I'd spent so much time going oh my god the content's not inclusive oh my god it's rubbish mm -hmm. that they said okay well if you think you could do better why don't you help us shape a plan and nine years later I was working with you know during that time with commissioners program makers commercial um, and planning teams to really think about the story we were selling back to our audiences. And then moved into the BBC. I took three, four months out, decided to change my career slightly, and then ended up working with a public service broadcaster like the BBC. But it was BBC Studios that I fell in love with because they had just turned into a commercial entity, had no blueprint for DNI. So any practitioner loves the idea of setting the footprint that maybe others will put. So that really excited me. And I could take my commercial knowledge from ITV and bring it into there. And then, and then that kind of snowballed into me working with for radio after them, and then landing this job to look after all of content output uh, across TV and radio. So yeah, right. quite a zigzaggy career. So it kind of came from quite overtly trying to get diverse voices in, just trying to get 
diverse narratives out as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, that's, that's, that's amazing, thank you. Um, Serena, do you want to tell us a little bit about your slightly shorter career? You're <laughs> <not younger>, but, <laughs> but you're doing a lot <laughs> in certain places. <laughs> yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. I can, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, as Helen mentioned, graduated uh, summer 2019. Um, it's not that long ago um, and straight after I graduated um, I think to be honest a few years before I graduated I already knew that I really wanted to go into publishing um, I think I'd always wanted to go into an art industry um, but just kind of wasn't sure which one I think I originally considered things like journalism um, anything where I could kind of use my writing skills um, but then I think during university, kind of working with the Society of Young Publishers and different groups, I found out about publishing and was like, this is what I want to do. Um, I love books and I just kind of want to be a part of kind of that creation and that commissioning and that process of kind of what is what kind of books are put out into the world. Um, and I initially kind of had an interest in children's publishing, especially. Um, so I kind of went straight into um, different work experience schemes and different placements um, straight in kind of that summer after uni. Um, and then I saw this scheme, which I kind of heard about. And there were quite a few different um, kind of traineeships or placements that are available at the moment um, that you can apply to in all of the different kind of arts careers. Um, and I applied through a website called Creative Access. Um, that's a website that or kind of a company or a charity that basically kind of tries to help any underrepresented voices or any underrepresented groups or any kind of anyone with a um, kind of specific socioeconomic background or anyone that typically isn't seen in certain industries. Um, it provides kind of guidelines and help for you to kind of break into those industries and actually kind of get your foot into the door. Um, so I applied to a traineeship at a company called Hachette, um, which is one of the kind of big UK publishers, um, and I got into their traineeship scheme. So I started that in September 2019, mm -hmm. um, and I've basically been there ever since. So I kind of completed um, my first placement and then got a job as editorial assistant at the company I'm currently at. And I think what fed into that was, um, as Helen mentioned, I worked in a magazine called Onyx while I was at uni, um, which was a magazine that me um, and one of my fellow Oxford students um, kind of came up with the idea for and worked on. And it was a magazine that platforms the voices and artwork of students of African and Caribbean heritage. Um, and obviously there's a lot of publications in Oxford, kind of very traditional. Um, very kind of long lasting um, publications and magazines. And I think we kind of wanted to create something that just felt a bit more open, I think, and a bit more inclusive and kind of just um, kind of stretched wider than anything we'd seen so far. Um, so we created, on, created Onyx. And I think working on that and seeing all of the different processes um, that went into the creation of a magazine, so kind of not just coming in and being kind of deputy editor, but actually kind of coming up planning from kind of the very beginning stages and seeing kind of it go into production and kind of basically working out all the details and launch and kind of seeing everything in one place, I think really helped when it came to actually wanting to work in publishing, and work out which area I actually wanted to go into. Um, and I did end up in kind of the typical editorial um, place that everyone thinks of when they think of publishing, even though there's so many different areas you can go into. Um, but I think I always kind of stuck to that love of actually wanting to kind of commission and wanting to actually read things as they came in and decide what was going out and actually be able to help with kind of trying to diversify um, the books that we were actually putting out into the world. Um, so that's um, kind of how I got to publishing. Um, and at the moment, as I said, I'm editorial assistant um, and I'm also part of the committee for the Society of Young Publishers. Um, so I'm kind of one of the events coordinators and recently um, one of the um, kind of inclusivity reps for the London committee. Um, so I'm kind of, as I said, doing a lot yeah. um, at the moment um, in a lot of committees um, and just kind of trying to help create change. So that's that's fantastic. And I'm, and I'm quite interested in the, um, the reason that you decided to kind of take a different strand um, and, and start Onyx. And it might have been because you wanted to, st to just, you know, publish and see the whole thing through and start your own thing. But was it that or did you feel that it was quite important to have a, a separate platform for in order to make diverse voices heard? Or was it 
rather, rather than working um, with Chawal or ISIS or one of the magazines that already exists in Oxford? Exactly. Um, I think with Onyx especially, um, I think a lot of the kind of um, newspapers that exist, still the magazines that existed, um, I think didn't necessarily feel as inclusive as they as we wanted them to, especially in terms of those more senior positions. Um, and it did kind of feel like you had to kind of know someone who was in necessarily or kind of, I don't know, be a certain kind of person to actually not only get into those groups and kind of edit the magazine or kind of work on things, but also to reach those more senior levels. Um, and I think what we really wanted to do was not only create a space where students from across the UK, not just from within Oxford University, but kind of from, in fact, beyond the UK, because we had submissions from the Caribbean, we had submissions from all over the UK could come together. Um, but we also wanted it to be a chance for um, other students at Oxford to also gain experience in that area and also kind of dive straight in and get involved with those more senior levels. Um, so it ended up being a group of eventually eight um, black women from kind of our few years at the university who ended up working together to basically create the whole team that led to this kind of 82 page glossy magazine that became Onyx. Um, and Onyx is still going at the moment. I'm not in the team anymore, um, but they're on their third um, edition at the moment, which just published. Um, and we basically just kind of wanted to create that legacy um, that kind of even after we finished and even after we moved on, there would be that new space that had been created. Um, and a new platform that people felt if they, for example, um, wrote in a slightly more experimental way or they did a type of art that they didn't feel necessarily might be published um, in something like the Chirwa um, and other magazines that they just felt that they had more of a sense of expression. Um, and I think there was such an uptake with Onyx and such a kind of great support that came from all of the colleges and all of the other students. Um, they did feel that this was a space that they just hadn't seen before. Um, and it was yeah. almost that kind of communal student run magazine that you'd see in things like zines. There were a lot of kind of groups at the university that did publish kind of smaller pamphlet type magazines that had kind of more inclusivity and more of a kind of experimental um, branch of including everything and all kinds of work. Um, and I think we really wanted that but in a kind of more traditional format. Um, and we did feel that it was something different and that we wouldn't have kind of had the same experience at um, kind of just joining any other magazine. So that's um, interesting. And it is, you know, it was a very kind of glossy, it is a glossy and professional looking <laughs> thing. You want to read it, you want to see the voices yeah. in it. And you, it does feel in Oxford anyway, something quite different. But Miranda, if you're working for a public um, service broadcaster, you know, this great kind of um, auntie for the nation, <laughs> supposedly, <laughs> how do you go about saying, well, you know, if you're the auntie for the nation, who's the nation, who's this for? I mean, how, how do you get those diverse voices into something that's already there and has this great, you know, institutional character? And Yeah, know. yeah, no, absolutely. I think irrespective of us being a, 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 a licensed speed broadcaster, even mm. working at ITV, there is a commercial imperative. So look, we know greater voices, greater representation. When you challenge yourself, in an environment that is safe, it brings out the best in creativity. And we also know that failing is another element of learning. So being less risk averse in terms of what we think audiences will consume, what they like, what they don't like, we often have to challenge that premise and accept that we're not here to pander to people's prejudices, but we're here to serve everybody. And what's beautiful about the BBC is that everybody pays for it. So therefore everybody has a stake in it and their voice needs to be heard. So it means that we have an opportunity to tell a real myriad of stories, learn from each other, see how things are being reflected from different communities and their lived experience. So as long as that, that premise and the BBC has its ambition, which is supposed is baked into educating, informing and entertaining. That is the baseline of what our license fee is all about. If you anchor that with understanding that each audience has a narrative about them that is really compelling, then the argument for diversity stops being an argument, it stops being a risk and it becomes an investment and an opportunity. Mm. So I think we've come a long way, irrespective of what sector you work in, to having to keep reselling the business case. I think we, you know, if you look at five years ago, 
everybody was having to pull statistics and data everywhere and having big committees to say, well, do I see it's really important? It's also a legal requirement. You don't have to put so much energy in that now. People get it. They understand the concept behind it. Translating that from a commitment, i.e. I commit to increasing diversity, can only be demonstrated through action. I might commit to be on a diet and still be a size 25, right? <laughs> the commitment itself is not enough. I actually have to do a few things to make that come to fruition. And I think, you know, we've all gone through, you know, whatever journey you're on, either professionally or personally, we go through different things, you know, either that manifests in a scheme and initiative to get the pipeline of talent in, whether or not you put targets about your leadership, so making sure that your recruitment practices are inclusive and fair, whether or not you put financial weight behind it to say, actually, we're ring fencing a pot of money to focus on these particular groups. I think we've all looked at different ways to change it. But the thing that underpins any of those acti activities to make sure it's successful is the accountability. It's about everybody owning this agenda. So you don't outsource it to a DNI team or you don't outsource it to HR that actually you recognize within your own role, there is a part that you can play. And when you do that, then actually when you see negative behaviors happening in the workplace, in your environment, you feel empowered and you want that collective community to sense check one another. Um, in the same way we get behind certain things like, you know, Nikes will do it, just do it. We all kind of understand what that means. Or if you get behind certain, you know, initiatives, like, you know, when I was working at ITV, it was classed one ITV. And so there was a culture sitting around that premise is that we all were in this together. We did things together. We benefited together. So institutions have ways of creating a culture. But in that, you have to make sure that diversity is baked into it. And like I said, it's not outsourced. We're all accountable. If we fail, which, you know, to some level, you could say that the d and agenda diversity inclusion has been society's biggest failing because it's something we talk about consistently, yet we don't hold ourselves accountable every year that we recognize we don't fail, we don't succeed. We wouldn't do that with finance. Every company has a budget. <laughs> if you overspend, somebody's hauling you in to ask you, how did that happen? And then, you know, if it happens two years in a row, somebody's taking that budget responsibility off you. Mm. So, you know, in the same way we say it's a business imperative, it's critical to our growth. We understand the importance of having diverse students who then go on to shape the country and other institutions. We have to make our actions mean something. Otherwise, it's a very nice commitment to have. Yeah. And how is, as the head of creative diversity, which sounds fantastically important, <laughs> sounds grand, and and it? people should definitely <laughs> listen to you and do what you say, um, um, and for you know, all equality standards, how do you get that? Um, I mean, I'm not putting it all on you, but how, how do you and the leadership and the board of the BBC, how do you think they need to do to act to um, give yeah, that? Yeah, so we've just telling them. We've come up, so the board at the BBC isn't as diverse as we'd like it to be visually. I mean, it's not saying that diversity is only about ethnicity, although I think the diversity conversation always seems to end up with that being the anchor of everything. But if you look at it in its broadest brush, I don't see disabled representation in our board. I don't see ethnic diversity in that board. We have good gender representation. So there's work to do there. If we can't get it right at the top, then the fundamental thing that we have to do at leadership is make them drive change within the organization so you know i may not affiliate with the lgbtq plus community it doesn't mean that i can't champion it it doesn't mean that i can't look out for it it doesn't mean that i have to be void of that in conversation decision making so i think if we have and you know across the country we have a number of large organizations that don't have diverse representation at the top because of that, you have to work twice as hard to make sure it is reflected in your conversation, in your decision making. So we've implemented a series of things to try and balance that out. We've um, put forward succession planning programs and diverse leadership programs. We set targets that mean senior positions must have a diverse board of candidates in it. And we've uh, put a target for gender representation within that, that process. We do reverse mentoring as well. 
Um, and then looking at the middle management layer, we have put stipulations that nobody's career can progress without demonstrating what you have done to advance diversity and inclusion. It is now a promotional requirement. Uh, there's lots of training that we do as well. Uh, we build it into our conversations. We make the connection between success being pivotal to creative difference. So actually now you're showing that there is financial commercial benefit to having diverse people rather than it sitting in a small box in your annual report saying we've got X amount of people who are diverse. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to do quite a lot. And you know, these things take time because it's an institution that's coming up to a hundred years. It wasn't designed to have people like you and me in it. <laughs> it was built with men in mind. <laughs> And then each generation, each societal change, people have gone, oh, we need to get some women in here. Opportunities presented itself. Oh, we don't have, you know, the building's not accessible. We need disabled people in the organization. Right, okay, well, let's get some ramps. Let's make sure the doors are wide. Let's make sure those opportunities. So it became a technical structural thing when we talked about disability as opposed to talent and people working. And then, you know, the manifestation of how our society saw one another you know, black and Asian and brown people were then like, okay, we've got a deficit of them, let's get, so, you know, for an institution that's a hundred years old, it has worked to the rhythm of society, recognizing it's not reflective enough and it's, but it's bolted it on. Yeah. So now it's about building it in the, the bloodline of who we are for the next 100 years. So, so it's about saying these are not, there's, there's creativity, which of course the BBC is absolutely marvelous at, and there's diversity, which would be nice for fairness. It's about diversity being a, the, the root of, of creativity. Yeah. Now, I wanted, you were talking about the, the fact that the board and the, the, the commissioners and the people who have the power at the moment um, are not themselves very diverse. And we were talking before, um, Serena and you and I, before we um, click the on button um, about the, 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 the problem that creates that it can, push all the, the, the onus and the labour of talking about race onto black people and all the onus and labour about talking about gender equality onto women and sucking up, you know, when it isn't fair, I'm just going to show that I don't mind, but I, I'm still going to put myself forward. And I'm very interested in what we you think we can do and some of the initiatives that the BBC has taken to help people, the, the maybe less diverse people at the top, acknowledge some of their privilege and some of their responsibilities without taking over and telling other people what they're going to do for them in a slightly patronizing way. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and please tell me how you square some of these circles as a white woman. Of <laughs> well, I don't know about Serena, but what the murder of George Floyd was a catalyst for a conversation that we've all known had needed to be said. And I became hugely exhausted by people wanting to talk to me about race. I was like, I've been black for 50 years. It's great that you've joined the conversation, but I'm not the encyclopedia of all things black. <laughs> and I have yeah. to give it, it was, it's, and Serena probably is laughing because it probably happened to her too. And what you found is organizations, as they were trying to learn and grow and understand, you know, race inequality, they were leaning, like you said, on their black colleagues and I don't think, you know, both in the wider creative industry and at the BBC, we put our arms around our black colleagues because we were trying to drain them of knowledge and, and having them as leading experts. So we didn't make sure that they were OK. We didn't double check if they were being triggered by these constant questions of what does it mean to be black? What's it like to face racism? How can I? I'm scared to have a conversation about race. It was draining. But equally so, because my profession means I need to be an educator of that, we had to come up with some tools. Otherwise, I probably would be sitting in a dark room rocking somewhere. So we created on the Creative Diversity website, uh, the um, Allies Toolkit. So it's a free service for anybody to use. And what it does is it takes the privilege game and it puts it online. So the privilege game is a series of questions that you ask that determines your privilege in society how you advance opportunities that have been open to you. And within that, you get a ranking. So anybody who plays, it actually collates the data from across the world of anyone's. So actually you're sitting in a big database. I think there's about 10,000 people in this. So it shows you your ranking against 10,000 other people. 
On the back of that, you get the opportunity to identify if you want to become an ally, a champion. So to use your privilege to benefit others. And I think that's the single biggest thing that we can all do. Um, and we've got seven criteria in there. Um, and if you open it up, it will tell you a little bit about each one. And if you register to become a particular ally, so for example, I, I picked a sponsor because one of the things that I can do in my role is sponsor and champion diversity throughout, you know, be in the room where their, their voices aren't visible and to champion an individual so they've got greater uh, profiling with key decision makers. And what it does is on a weekly basis, monthly basis, it sends you a little note to say, hi, you're the sponsor. Here's a couple of things you might want to try out this week or this month. And it will do that for you for 12 months. So it's a it's a continuously learning tool. As I say, it's absolutely free. Um, even if you just play the game, it's fun to, to just see. And you can change your avatar, can change your answers. And you can see, actually, if I change my gender, what advantages would I have had in society versus perhaps the one that I have today? So it's quite, it's quite a fun tool. Yeah. You, you were talking before we came on about curiosity of connection. And I think that's so interesting. Um, Jan Morris um, wrote in her book about um, changing gender, how having lived a large part of her life as a kind of quite successful white man, people stopped finding her as clever and as funny and as interesting when she was a woman and she stopped finding herself as clever and as funny as interesting or expecting to be found that clever. And I thought it was a really interesting point about, you know, not many people have that experience of, of, of changing how they're perceived in quite that way, but it was a very interesting point. I mean, Serena, I wonder what you think as a sort of recent Oxford graduate about that and some of the things you think these great grand institutions like the BBC and Oxford University can do that don't put all the burden on you. Yeah, I think I would say, on you to ask you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I would say it's kind of getting that balance because I think you need that balance between giving people that do kind of want to have that space to kind of give their opinion and give feedback and kind of when you're asking for feedback I actually want it because I think there is kind of a sense almost of if people ask questions especially if it is to do with diversity and inclusion they might not necessarily especially in a bigger company want to hear the truth of those things. Um, so I think it is kind of asking the questions, but also being ready to hear the kind of very truthful answers um, that would be given to you by kind of staff or by students in kind of institutions and keeping like checking in. But also, as Miranda said, not having that be a big weight and not having it feel that it's only certain students. So it's only those kind of underrepresented students um, that do need to be that voice um, and kind of making it feel as if everyone is doing the work. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to me to kind of hear the stuff that is being done um, at the BBC. I think obviously once you're within a company, you know what that company is doing, but you don't necessarily know how that fits against what everyone else is doing. So a lot of the things you mentioned, like the reverse mentoring, um, for example, or kind of having those targets, I think are things that we have, or kind of having diversity within every single person's appraisal and within every single person's measure of progress, again, is something that we do at Hachette or have done for a long time. Um, but I think things like those reverse mentoring schemes really help because again, it gives that voice um, to certain people who are underrepresented at board level. So for, at Hachette, for example, the way we do it is um, they pair members of the board with kind of more junior um, staff members who are underrepresented at kind of on that board. And it's kind of an exchange of knowledge in that obviously those junior staff members can learn so much from the people on the board, but they can also learn a lot from those junior staff members. Um, and I think we discussed this a little bit earlier pre-call, but I think it is also that sense of how much you can say, depending on your level. Um, because I think obviously, again, making it open so that even as someone who's just started, who kind of has come into a big institution or come into a company that's existed, for all of these years, you can still speak out. So obviously it's a lot easier for someone at the top to say, I've noticed this thing, I have an issue with it, or we need to be doing more here than it is for someone who's kind of six months in, who's kind of like, if I say something about this, kind of how will that come across? Or kind of, will people see me as sensitive or will people kind of, um, kind of back off a little bit and say, I don't know why this person has raised this or they're not at the level to. I think having a kind of team or having a company where at any level you can speak up about something without kind of fearing how that will come across um, is I think what 
every company needs to actually make progress. Um, and obviously, um, in most companies, or at least kind of in publishing, the people at the top aren't necessarily the most diverse. So therefore those voices don't tend to be up there. And therefore those conversations can sometimes be had a little bit less um, than they might on kind of the more junior levels. Um, so it's kind of bringing those two things together um, and making sure that all of the conversations that are often had by more junior staff or more underrepresented staff does reach those board levels and then actually go somewhere rather than kind of the fight to get it to the top and then they don't really know what to do with it. Um, so I think it is that sense of collaboration and communication that is really needed, but also that needs to move on to more tangible stages and progress rather than just kind of going into a report and then nothing happens. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, all these, these C words, curiosity of connection, collaboration and communication. I'm, one of the reasons I particularly wanted to talk to you about your industry, so this is obviously a conversation that needs to happen everywhere where there's power and um, ability to create society, but the creative industries, I, I do think are really important because of that curiosity of connection, that that's how when, when somebody can imagine imagine themselves different and not assume the world is naturally the way it is because for some people the world has been built around the way they naturally are those are the people who've had power over a long period of time and it can feel quite normal and for people to think to, to check what, what isn't normal and to, and to think about how things need to change I'm quite interested in how you think uh, you, how, you know the the best ways to do this is it to take a strand for example like the brilliant Steve McQueen small axe films and take a whole strand of I say see see my experience I am an amazing incredibly senior incredibly well thought of filmmaker let me take these narratives and, and show them in the way that people see them or is it about making sure that there are really diverse people in in soap operas and just casually along the way how you know, you, you I'm, I'll put it to you both, but Serena, you were, you were talking about the danger of being a, a, a black woman in editorial, that you'll be doing the diversity list then, <laughs> you know, rather yeah. than actually you'll be finding really good stories and publishing them. So um, how do you think we do this? I think there's a need for both, to be honest with you. I think you need those big landmark stories that challenge our audience's perception of their understanding of a particular subject matter. Crip Tales does that beautifully well. If I think about children's Jojo and Gran Gran all alone, there's a beautiful stories actually where children themselves don't see some of the, the complexities that we add to connecting with one another. They're very embracing of anyone as long as they're fun and they can connect and they can enjoy each other's company. Kids don't have the same filters that we somehow have acquired in adulthood. And I get it, um, you know, society has shown us that good comes in a certain package from a certain destination. And so television is really important because it plays such a vital role, both te television and film actually, because it reflects back what it thinks society looks like, how a certain group of individuals behave. And when we, when we use stereotypes as a way to shape the narrative of someone, often that's the bedrock of their education because they're not confronted or they don't have a balanced view and a different perspective. So if I think about it, even historically in my own uh, atmosphere, the LGBTQ agenda wasn't something that was talked about. We used certain words and it meant something different back then to what it means now, but television formed a lot of my understanding about that agenda. Now, I then, as I was getting older, was opened up to a lot of people from different backgrounds. So I started to course correct what television was telling me. Books started to re-educate me about different groups, but I was able to balance out what had started to become my baseline. So it is so important that this narrative, this medium that we work in that has the power to inform people's thinking on a mass scale, we're talking millions of people at any one time can be subjected to information that then determines how they interact with you on the street or in the workplace or how they perceive you in a magazine or online, especially online where it's so unfiltered, you say what you want, you have your autonomy. Uh, behind it. Television has a responsibility to get it right as quickly and as often as possible. Now I'm not saying, for example, we went through this mirage where dis disability 
you know, if you look to the disability, gender, you know, disabled people weren't allowed to have fun and they weren't allowed to be criminals. You're not allowed to talk to talk about the disability agenda in that way. They can't possibly have a relationship or enjoy sex. These things don't happen to disabled people. You know, they're supposed to be seen through the lens of unable to provide, always needing a carer, poor me. So if we build that in people's narrative, when they see them in the workplace, they don't see them as equal. You've already set the premise that they, you see them as other and therefore they need all this extra assistance because they can't think, they can't do. In the same way that we often did that for women, women were seen as objectified individuals that you slapped on the bum in certain programs, which then when you came into the workplace, people thought that was acceptable. So it's so powerful that we do have these big Steve McQueen type moments, Michaela Cole, I may destroy you. You know, cryptos, like I said, we have these, you know, Gentleman Jack that looks at the LGBT, big moments in time where we talk about those narratives. But I wanna see myself in EastEnders. I also want to see myself in Coronation Street. I want to see someone leaning up on a lamppost on the mobile phone that might look like me. Yeah. So I just want to see myself on a regular basis, not being a criminal, not being a drug dealer, not having multiple baby fathers. I just want to be- you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? Uh, there are so much more interesting stories you can tell about different groups without the stereotypes, which everybody knows. And it's quite boring as a storytelling piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got a question, actually. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I completely agree. And I think a key thing is that nuance. Because um, I think we have a similar thing in publishing where you might have a really big breakout book, Queenie, for example, by Candice Carty-Williams. Mm. So everyone went, this is amazing. This isn't something I've seen before. This is kind of um, a commercial novel that features a young Black woman. And that's just not something I've ever seen. Kind of as someone of Caribbean heritage myself, I was like, I haven't seen this before. Um, these are kind of experiences I have that I've just never seen in literature, even though I've been reading widely since I was very, very young. Um, but I think the danger, again, is then not stopping there. And also, again, that nuance in not being like every book that then has a character that is a Black woman is the new Queenie. <laughs> and there is that nuance in that you wouldn't necessarily say if a thriller came in by kind of a white author, you wouldn't then say this is X author, because there's allowed to be that nuance of there's thousands of different stories, millions of them, that have kind of a character of that background. And I think sometimes there doesn't seem to be that same scope when it is an underrepresented voice where it does kind of call back to that one example. And you want to get to the point, as you said, where those examples are so common that you can't point to one and say, this is the example, this is kind of the diverse show. You do want it to be kind of everywhere you look. And I think, as Miranda said, you also want to avoid those stereotypes because you don't want to say, OK, this show has kind of um, a person of colour in it, but they're the best friend. Or this show has a, has a gay character in, but they're kind of the stereotypical kind of gay best friend. And they don't get their own lines and their own storyline and their own background. And I think across all kind of the arts industries, it's, again, getting that balance where you do have more diversity across all platforms that have their own nuance and have the kind of more of an equality with kind of the voices that you'd already see and kind of with the kind of white writers or kind of the white filmmakers or kind of the big filmmakers that you've seen so far. Um, you want to kind of bring those voices up but them not to be the one example of the one breakout um, and make, it, make a point of it kind of being more common. Um, but also have that complexity that you'd want in any other character. Um, and I think it's, it's, it, it starts from such a young age. That's the problem. What, what we're trying to do is unpick something that has been in our psyche for a very long time. I run a unconscious bias course, Next Steps, and one of the things that I get people to do as part of the first exercise is I say to them, right, okay, we all read books, fortunate to have access to books, but in your bookshelf, Tonight, I want you to look at your bookcases. And for those of you who've got children, how many books have got characters and stories that aren't the same as your ethnic background? Mm -hmm. Then they come back the next day and they're like, oh my God, Miranda, I didn't realize. And I was like, well, no, you wouldn't. Because obviously mm -hmm. on the bookshelves, they're not accessible. It's not, you know, you go to what you go to. You want these books to educate your kids. But what we're, sub what we're subconsciously mm -hmm. doing is starting the course of what good looks like mm. without providing different opportunities. That's why the education, you know, it's been a long time, it's been well known that we're not teaching our kids about history other than white English, British history, 
but yet the students that are in the school have come from multiple countries and different generations mm -hmm. which has no visibility in our educational system yeah so mm -hmm. you know i think when by the time you get to television by the time you get to publishing <laughs> all this stuff <laughs> that we're now trying to get you to think differently, see women in a different way, see disability in a different way, the type of language we use, the interactions we have, the nervousness, that's all been built in in your pre-education. Yeah. So of course it feels clunky and difficult and fearful because you're worried about, if I talk about racism, Miranda gonna think I'm a racist. Okay, we're not talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it makes sorry, Helen. I was going to say it makes me think of things. Something that crossed over between books and films is things like um, Knots and Crosses by Mallory Buckland, which is obviously adapted um, into a show. And that kind of I remember reading that when I was very young. And it's things, even little things like um, the fact that they had the kind of brown plasters. And I remember kind of so many people were astounded by that. They said I hadn't even considered that plasters were something that didn't necessarily suit every skin type. But when I read that, I realised. I think there were so many discussions around that, especially when the TV show came out, when people would say, oh, I'm not sure about this show. I feel like this part might be racist, or I'm not sure about this reaction here. And I think so many people watching it, um, that kind of were the people who were kind of flipped around and were kind of black people watching it, were seeing people react to the microaggressions that they had faced for kind of their whole life and kind of seeing people suddenly confronted with it. But I think also that sense of kind of audience as well. Because so I think, and I'm sure it's not something we only see in publishing, but I think there's also the danger of kind of those big groups who don't necessarily consider the other side thinking that certain books or certain voices will only be read by underrepresented voices. And if a show has black characters, it will only be watched by black mm -hmm. people. And I think that is, isn't true at all. And I think it's something that kind of has that danger of, again, limiting kind of what is put out based on kind of sales and based on numbers and based on that kind of profit sense um, about who the readership is and kind of how that kind of balances out with what's actually being produced and commissioned. It's, it's like the, 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 the way books um, mm -hmm. written by women are marketed very clearly to women and there's I think there's research and you know men read far fewer books proportionally of the books they read in a year by women than women read by men because women just assume they'll read what what comes out but um i've got a couple of questions and do feel free to ask questions oh participants um in the q a box and i'll try and get through as many as i can because it's very interesting but someone who's asked a couple of questions that are really pertinent to what you've been saying um somebody said has asked you whether you think there are still a lot of um stereotypes in television and film, we will have a black person and we'll have an Asian person, but they will be quite stereotyped ideas of what this family is and the Asian family will run the corner shop and, 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 and the wife will be quite surrendered and the, you know, the black man will be a bit of a lad. Um, and these are an accurate representation of different cultures. And then the same questioner has said that as, uh, themselves as a performer of, a performer of Asian heritage, he'd always, or they had always thought um, that they could only play somebody quite nerdy or a child prodigy and they couldn't have a role model that somebody who just looks like them could just be an ordinary person with ordinary relationships and ordinary everyday experiences and always has to be the person who's different and I wonder how we try and break that down. Yeah I think I'd like to say I, you know I think there's been a lot of strides in television and potentially film whereby the stereotypes are no longer the big anchors of what we see. I mean, if you look at Bridgerton on Netflix, I love drama. Obviously nobody pitches drama to me because they think, well, I wouldn't want love drama. I love period drama, such a period drama junkie. So when Ava DuVernay made that and actually the tapestry of it, it really broke away from stereotypes. And also I'm a big Ava DuVernay fan. So, you know, when she did White Tiger as well, that Asian depiction of storytelling, of growth, it was brilliant, very different to what we're accustomed to seeing perhaps here. And again, we've done that in the UK with a number of programmes where actually we stop using those stereotypes to tell some really interesting perspectives. So, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race is another example of that. Actually, you know, a black, um, icon being shown in a different lens to perhaps what we think the black narrative is about. So I think as creatives, we see the benefits of that dual identity that people are possessing and how that then creates that curiosity of interest. I think it's a safe medium 
Because I think if you look at the BBC and you think about us historically, you think that's what we want. So then creators come to us with those stories thinking that's the only thing we commission. And we're getting a lot better at pushing back and asking for something deeper, much more richer. Um, and like I said, some of the, the programs that we've made before should be a shop window to that. But the stereotypes are successful because audiences buy into it with no effort whatsoever. You know, and there will be places for that. I think, you know, I don't want us to all abandon those stereotypes, you know, but what I do want is a much more balanced view of the world. And so if you want to tell stories about, you know, women behaving and be being portrayed in a certain way, then I actually need to see business women, which you saw in suits. I want to be able to see successful women, which you see in doctors. I want, I want the wider narrative of the women's story. And I think as creatives, we're now getting a bit bored of the stereotype. So I'm hoping it's correcting itself. Yeah, I, and I completely agree. I think it that question in terms of, do you have those stereotypes and they count as diversity? I think, as I said, that's the danger of kind of, yes, we have diversity in our program, but I think it's also analyzing how that diversity comes across. And again, continuing that conversation because a book might be published or a show might be put out where they say, this is amazing, this is, Full of diversity we've kind of done what we wanted to do but I think it's also then getting that feedback from the viewers and kind of from everyone that's seen it and saying what do you think of this and kind of how did this come across to you because I think there are um, I think as was phrasing that question things that might be seen to have counted as diversity but when you actually kind of talk to the people that are represented in that show or supposedly represented in that show they might not necessarily see it that way um, and I think just that sense of almost kind of who things are aimed at sometimes and who might count it as diversity um, is quite important. And just having that range of perspectives um, would really help with that and avoid help avoid those stereotypes and kind of one dimensional views of certain people in society. And I think we've come on a real journey because, you know, if you take where we were, so if you take Luther, for example, mm. Idris Elba lands a big major role. We haven't seen a strong male character and we all got excited. Even I got excited. Helps that he's good looking, but I really got excited <laughs> about think it. You were not alone. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but about, and by the time we got into season two, the shine of it had gone because he was the only black person who had no black character friendships, didn't eat West Indian food, didn't have any black friends. So the stereotype, the success of getting a big juggernaut black actor, which then gave courage to other black actors to feel that we could commission and make content was great. But the authenticity that sat behind it became problematic in series two. And we're kind of like, whoa, he's not. No black man I know operates like that. <laughs> it's great that he's there, but that's not really real. And so you can quickly lose an audience if if the authenticity isn't there. And you know, and I think that's why stereotypes have worked really well because societies have accept that as the baseline norm. Whereas the communities in which those stereotypes belong to, we kind of like we don't act like that. That's not my <laughs> lived experience. I don't know what person you think that relates to, but that's just not me. <laughs> Yeah. And I do that a lot. As a woman, I look at content, I'm like, which women did you consult with? <laughs> I don't know women so that sorry. operate like that. We don't run around doing those things. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it has a season, definitely. Not in those heels anyway. Oh, okay. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam Spencer, who's a, who's a Mansfield student, and he's asked about, you know, he does lots of creative things here, but he's asked about um, the way you felt at the beginning of your career, Miranda, that you had lots of opportunities and were able to kind of zigzag into it. And, and he's asking about, well, is that going to be the case for people from this generation graduating from uni in a post-pandemic world? How are we going to make sure that pipeline of, of diverse voices carries on um, informing the conversations we have? And yeah, so that the receivers and the, the people commissioning are, are, are diverse and can get it right. Yeah, I think this generation is, it's, I, you know, if I, <laughs> my mum would have said my generation was so much more fortunate. So obviously I'm going to say your generation is much more fortunate. This is the biggest entrepreneurial generation of our time. You don't have the constraints of having to do a nine to, nine to five job. And, you know, that being your only way of sustaining your career, you can go online and create your content through your mobile phone and actually draw an audience base in a digital space in a way that I've never, that wasn't an option for me. 
Yeah, uh, so I think there's such a unique way in which your craft and your skills can be honed and you can actually connect with the types of people that appreciate and value your audience. And trust me, we've seen the conversion from digital to linear to television, where actually people have bought an audience base with them and we've gone, cha-ching, we'll have you for a five-year deal. So I think, you know, the creativity and freedom and flexibility that the digital space is giving means that the zigzagging career that I have is now just in a digital form. Uh, the partnerships that you can do, you know, if I think about when people are coming out of film school and having all this financial weight behind them and the collaborations weren't always as easy to, you know, you couldn't set up your own production company and then decide that you're gonna pitch for commissions. I mean, that, that was like a 10 year journey. You know, people are coming out of establishments such as your own and they're forming their own production groups and they're creating the, the content and narrative that they want and they're finding their audience and their voice. And then they're saying to production companies such as me, look what I can do. Look what I can do with zero money. Imagine what would happen if you gave me a couple of mil. Yeah. yeah. And, and it is, you know, it, it was much more, you know, many more barriers to entry, weren't there? Because all the equipment was so expensive and you needed yeah. access to an edit suite and you needed all those things. So... I do remember about 10, 15 years ago thinking the kind of telly people who I know who work in telly who want to make is going to die. And then, sorry about the BBC, but you know, Netflix <laughs> came along and Apple TV came along. Suddenly it's a kind of golden age of make things. And if you make the most interesting content, people will watch it. There'll be a platform for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Can I ask you um, both, really? Um, um, Sean um, Zinanen, who's, a, who's, a, who's also a Man's Plus student, and he's the uh, chair of the Caribbean Society at Oxford this term. And he says it's a great webinar, so thank you. Thank you. Um, but um, he's also got a question really for you, Miranda, but I think it could be addressed to you both, which is if, if you're a student and you're looking for a career in the BBC or in publishing, say, do you recommend that you try and get work experience or an internship programme kind of go into that establishment? Or is it that slightly more entrepreneurial approach that you were talking about? I mean, perhaps you could both talk about that. Miranda, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I think so. The BBC have quite a number outside of a pandemic environment. We have a number of entry level routes into the organisation. We do internships, apprenticeship programmes. We do specific production programs that can give you an entry level in. So whether or not it's through a runners or a research program, uh, we do mentoring programs and schemes. So if you go on to the BBC website, we've got a kickstart your career page. It talks about all the different initiatives that are paid because that's really important. If you think about social mobility, that people actually can afford to work in our sector as well is another big area uh, that knocks out so much talent in our in, in industry. Equally, nobody working in our field should be, will find it an easy route in if you don't do some of the basics. And, you know, as you come out of your academic studies, number one golden rule is you have to research. You cannot come to any institution and go, I really want to work here because, and not know anything about our content. I couldn't possibly say I want to work in fashion and say, oh, you know, that that thing that you made last week. So you have to do due diligence. I suggest that if you see a program or a show that you like, look at the credits. The people that you want come last. They tend to stay on the screen longer because of the heavyweights. They're exec producers, serious producers. Email them. And the BBC is going to hate it. But the BBC email address is normally <laughs> first name dot middle name at BBC dot co dot UK. You can get hold of anybody. <laughs> it's really that simple. Um, but when you do engage with them, remember two things. Firstly, if you don't get a response, it doesn't mean they don't like you. Assume that they're busy and there is a thin line between becoming a nuisance and a pest. The nuisance element is a bit that you can manage yourself. So when you correspond with someone and you don't get the response back in the first couple of weeks, just assume it's not about you, it's about somebody managing their diary. But in your email, stipulate that you'll call them back again or contact them again in a couple of weeks time once they've had the chance to review your email. Then call, contact them back in that couple of weeks time and say, just following up on the email, wondered if you had a chance to review it. Here's a link to some of my work. I'll try you again in a couple of weeks time. You're giving that individual the opportunity to know there's gonna be a rhythm to this conversation. If you're not getting any leeway after those three interactions, you now need to find other people atmosphering in that circle. And again, 
lots of contacts on our websites about how you engage. So I think it's really, it's about looking at what's what we already have to offer in the industry. Big broadcasters, whilst they have opportunities, that you're not going to learn as much. So smaller indies have much more opportunity and you can accelerate your career a lot faster and much more nimble as well. So you could end up on set being a runner and end up being, you know, a production assistant by the end of the, of the shoot because the overheads are tight and they need to grow talent. So I do advise people to cut their teeth with the indie sector, but equally use the broadcasters and the opportunities that they have as well to get in. And I would just kind of add to that, as Miranda said, kind of use your connections as much as you can. Um, like I think, so I did um, one of the career talks at Mansfield last summer. And I think one of the great things about that was, I think one of the things I suggested were kind of using things like LinkedIn. Um, using things like the alumni um, groups that you have in college, using things like just the internet, social media, for example, for publishing. Twitter is a big sphere that we use. There's most of the time people are happy for you to follow them, to, to message them. And I think when I said that, I had multiple students message me and say, would you be able to have a chat? Would you be happy to answer some questions? Could we have a Zoom call? Um, and I think, as Miranda said, most of the time, people would be happy to. I feel like most people that love their job would love to talk about it and to help anyone who kind of wants to get into those industries. So I'd say that being number one to kind of reach out to any connections you can find. Um, but also, again, things like Creative Access, which, again, have roles that are open to everyone. They have roles for specific groups um, and look across the whole industry. And I think even if you don't find something on there that you like, it can be a good starting point to actually kind of see a job or a role that you didn't even know existed before. Or as Miranda said, kind of see indies and see different companies that might not be the big companies. They might not be the Penguin or the Hachette or they might not be the BBC or the ITV, but they might still do exactly what you want to do. Um, and then also again, as Miranda kind of mentioned, those smaller teams. Um, and when you're sending kind of, you could send like perspective CVs, for example, um, where the bigger companies, it might be more likely that you can get in through a set scheme or a traineeship, or they might have the funds to actually have those bigger programs, but a smaller company. Um, so for example, I did work since at a company called Walker Books, which is kind of an independent children's publisher, might put things on their website, for example, or might be happy for you to contact them. Um, but even within those big those bigger companies, there can still be smaller teams. So I work on a team of four people, um, which is very small within the company. And it has meant, as Miranda said, that I can um, do more than I might necessarily get to do. For example, I've already started commissioning um, my own books, which you don't typically do at assistant level. So I think uh, it is doing that research, but also speaking to anyone you can speak to about that industry, even if you think that they won't be able to help you with what you specifically want to know. They might know people or they might kind of know something wider about a different industry that they can help you with. So if you if you see a connection, just kind of go for it um, and speak to them. Fantastic. Can I just fit in one more question because it's coming? I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, um, which is you are forging your way as amazing creative women of colour and trying to amplify other people's voices in workplaces that are not as diverse as they should be. So how do you go on feeling good in your skin in a workplace that is not as diverse as it should be now? Serena, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say for me, um, and it's probably one of the reasons why I try to do so much, um, I think it is just trying to be a part of that change. And I think, as we said, we'd hope that everyone would want to do that kind of respect, like irrespective of their background. But I think making sure that you are kind of doing the things you want everyone else to do um, and again you shouldn't feel pressured to do that and you shouldn't feel that kind of because of who you are your company has put that pressure on you um, but you should always kind of have that confidence to speak out and kind of it sometimes it sometimes depends on your team I think I have such a great team around me that are really supportive and do always want to hear my view on certain things or for me to kind of tell them if there's something that they're doing wrong and I think obviously that confidence, confidence is something you kind of have to build up over time a lot of the time. Um, but I think a good company and a good team will always be that support um, and kind of make sure you have that scope to talk. Um, and I think if I was in a company that was less supportive, um, I think sometimes you do have to pick your battles. Um, 
as bad as it might sound. And I think especially when you're more junior, um, it is sometimes kind of building that group and community around you and kind of deciding when might be the best times for you to say something and what the best forum for that is. And I think one of the key advantages for me on the traineeship was that I not only had the added support, but that I had a team of four other trainees um, who were also people of colour, also starting in the industry at the same time, that I could kind of talk to about things. And even if I didn't necessarily take it, take certain things higher, I could always talk to them. And I think having that kind of group is something that's really key um, and having their feedback on which things you should kind of raise. And because sometimes you might say, you know what, it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal like someone said something and I think I'm just going to brush it under the carpet and it might take someone else to say no that's kind of you just kind of pulling back for no reason that is something that you should raise or that is something that kind of is a big deal and you need to talk about and I think sometimes it is just having that mirror and having someone that you can kind of trust and talk about things with that you need to be able to then know what to do because you can very quickly kind of just say it's me overreacting, it's me being sensitive um, and that won't necessarily lead to change. So I think finding your group and finding your people is something that has really helped me as being quite junior in the industry. Um, but actually Miranda will have um, kind of more tips from a kind of more senior level. Um, I think I really struggled with this one for most of my career, if I'm being really honest, I've experienced racism and discrimination not just in the creative industry, but quite a lot of times in my career. And so I very quickly learned that it was important for me to adapt, to be a comfortable version to my employers and maybe my bosses so that they wouldn't, they wouldn't suppress my career or they didn't see me as a threat. And I spent a lot of time internalizing that and benchmarking my success based on their assessment of me. Um, and in doing so, I mean, I'm quite a competitive person anyway. And I started off the conversation by saying previously that I always wanted to be the best. So that kind of, you know, that self um, analytical element has helped me to get to where I've gotten to. But actually the journey getting there hasn't always been so great. So, you, you know, you deal with what you can. And, and the important thing is that to be able to be as much of yourself as you possibly can to get to where you need to. And through my experiences, I very quickly worked out, I need to get to the top of the food chain so less people can dictate to me who and what I should be to fit in. And there's an element of becoming older that gives you that flexibility as you get higher up the food chain. So I know there's less people to impress other than the people that are standing above me, whereas actually there was a whole organization that needed to like the version of Miranda to see her as being someone who was good or excellent. And I think as I've now acquired this particular role uh, and I know the privileges and access it gives me, I feel more like I can be myself in perhaps more than some of the roles I've occupied before. And that in itself is really refreshing. I'm not having to internalize managing other people's expectation because that in itself is exhausting. And I'm, I think I wake up most days tired without having to be tired doing the day job. So, and what's come out of it is I'm much more comfortable and relaxed. I mean, new environments as it does for anybody, you're always kind of assessing the situation, the room, other people that look like you that you can get a baseline and feel comfortable. You do that with gender, you do that with just, you do that with anything, any environment where you can see yourself reflected back gives you a sense of calm. And as a leader, what I have absolutely made it as a mantra of who I am is when I'm leading teams, I'm really open about who I am. This is my working style. This is how I like to be engaged. This is how you get the best out of me. This is how I behave under pressure. This is what my disability looks like when it is put in this situation. So what you're doing, what I like to do is create this baseline of equality. I often surrender my power to other members of my team or other people that are junior to me that aren't you know, orbiting my atmosphere because I know that my job gives me access to board members, gives me access to leaders. So I don't need to be top dog in every space that I'm walking in. I can actually let the junior person's voice have more weight than mine. I can surrender my, my power to somebody else who in turn is empowered to do greatness. 
and it doesn't compromise my skill set. It doesn't dumb down my ability. What it does is it grows future leaders and God knows we need future leaders to feel empowered to be themselves. So like I said, I've come, I've come through a completely different route. It wasn't always easy to be genuine, authentic Miranda, but as I've gotten higher up and I feel less threatened, less, I, I think care less about other people's opinion about me in whatever way they want to opinionate me. I validate myself, which is something I never did before. I always allowed somebody else to validate my work. Whereas actually I look at my work and go, girl, that's good. And I'm all right if nobody else doesn't like it. That's really empowering. So yeah, and as a leader, I now want to give my power to others. Yeah. And it's, I think certainly it's something you wish, I wish some of those things I'd acquired earlier. <laughs> I would like other people who are younger than me to acquire them earlier too, and to be good in their skin earlier in their lives and careers. So um, I think it's absolutely fantastic what you've both been saying. It's been very empowering. Um, somebody's asked me in the um, Q&A box, uh, Miranda, for the website address so i'll if you can um the the, the privilege yes yeah, so it's um about. it's www.bbccreativediversity but i'll also make sure that i send it to helen with the links yeah. so you guys can access it okay listen this is absolutely fantastic thank you so much for your time and your amazing thoughts thank you miranda and serena um we're going to put this up on YouTube. So anyone who's been listening and thinks they have friends or, or family or other people who benefit from this, please let them know. Please share the link. Um, we will share the love and our brilliant ideas in our Mansfield Public Talks because that's who we are. Um, next week is the last um, talk in this terms series. It's Patrick Cabanda, who is a very um, unusual man. He is a Juilliard School trained pianist. He's also a World Bank economist. He's written a book called The Creative Wealth of Nations about how the arts can promote development. He's a fascinating man. So do join that one. Um, some of the people I know on um, in the audience here have given me ideas for other speakers. Please do. It's amazing who you can get if you ask um, for these talks. And I love to share ideas in this way. So thank you both very much. Um, and um, I will see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>